I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we report on deadly missile strikes in Kyiv, further incursions across the Russian border in Belgorod, and we hear the latest updates on diplomacy and politics in Central Asia and the Caucasus. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. We need a military strategy for Ukraine to gain a decisive advantage on the battlefield to win the war. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Thursday, the 1st of June, one year and 97 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today I'm joined by our assistant comment editor Francis Turnley, foreign reporter Mayna Nanu, foreign correspondent James Kilner speaking to us from Georgia, and former tank commander and Telegraph contributor Hamish de Bratton-Gordon. I started by asking Francis for the latest news from Ukraine. I'll start with an exchange of missiles and shelling that we've seen in the past 24 hours. We learned this morning that at least three people, including a child, have died in Kyiv after Russian ballistic missiles struck the city during the night. A nine-year-old girl and her 24-year-old mother were among those three killed in the strikes. A 33-year-old woman also died, Ukraine's national police have said, adding that 12 others were injured. This would be the highest death toll in a single attack on the Ukrainian capital over the past month, if true. The attack also damaged apartment buildings, a medical clinic, a water pipeline and cars, we understand. Ukraine's general staff reported that the air defences intercepted all 10 missiles, which is identified as Iskonda ballistic missiles. I'll be frank, the pictures coming out of the city are horrific this morning, including one of a thin layer of foil covering the body of the nine-year-old watched over by a man reported to be her grandfather, who's apparently squatted next to his dead family for several hours until a chair was found for him. President Zelensky is in Moldova at present, which we'll come to, but there have been some very strong remarks from senior Ukrainian figures this morning, including Mrs. Zelensky. She's tweeted out, Children's Day has to be about safe childhood, summer, life. But today it is about new crimes of the Russian Federation against Ukrainian children. A nine-year-old girl was killed in the shelling of Kyiv and another now is in hospital. It is a pain for all of us. Our thoughts are with their families. Now, we reported last week on the strike on the medical clinic in Kyiv that saw three people killed. And there has been an update on this. Apparently, Ukrainian police have opened a criminal investigation into what happened. As witnesses said, the air raid shelter they rushed to failed to open. So a local resident has told Reuters that the the air alert sounded. My wife took our daughter and they ran to the entrance. The entrance was closed. There were already maybe five to ten women with children. No one opened up for them. They knocked loudly enough. They tried to enter the shelter. No one opened up for them and my wife died. So we'll obviously be covering that in more detail as we hear more. There are also reports today of uninterrupted shelling hitting a town in the Russian region of Belgorod, bordering Ukraine, and that injuring eight people. That's according to the governor there. They've said they've, it's facing uninterrupted shelling with rocket launchers, and that has been posted on Telegram with Ukrainian forces apparently, according to the Russians, bombarding the centre and periphery of the town, adding that eight people were injured and there have been no fatalities. Now, what we don't know is whether these are bombardments by official Ukrainian armed forces or by some of the pro-Ukrainian elements who crossed the border last week. If we know, we will obviously let you know, but fortunately we just don't. Evidently, however, there is continued activity there and James is going to discuss that later on. I imagine Hamish will have some thoughts on that too. Another interesting story we've not yet discussed on the podcast is that Russia have claimed to have destroyed Ukraine's last warship two days ago in a missile strike. That's according to a Russian defense ministry spokesman. They've tweeted out the last warship of the Ukrainian Navy, the Yuri Olifonenko, was destroyed at a warship mooring in the port of Odessa. The vessel was hit with high high precision weapons 
obviously something we would we would more accurately describe as missiles on May 29th. But there are no further details at this time. A spokesperson for the Ukrainian Navy has declined to respond to Russia's claims. The Navy said it doesn't disclose details about losses in the war. And I should say that we're hearing all sorts of reports about this today with speculation as to who exactly was aboard and what was on board. But I don't think it's right for us to report unsubstantiated rumours. But so there will be more on that as we have it. We are looking into it. Final military space update is from Prigozhin, the head of the Wagner Group. He has said his group will fight on in Ukraine if his men get a separate section of the front without having to depend on the clowns, his words, who who run swathes of Russia's armed forces. So he's currently celebrating his 67th birthday at a training camp and he confirmed that the Wagner Group would leave the city of Bakhmut on the 5th of June after handing it over to the Russian army but added that if the whole chain of command is 100% failed and will only be led by clowns who turn their people into meat then we will not participate further in this war it's been a tough year which i think is quite an understatement frankly many are interpreting this as an invitation to the regime that if wagner is to stay engaged then the kremlin will have to grant them further strategic autonomy he is seemingly fighting a one-man war against the defence establishment at present. Uh, he posted an update yesterday, uh, and we reported on this on our live blog after our broadcast, that he's asked prosecutors to investigate whether senior Russian defence officials had committed any crime before or during the war in Ukraine. He said he'd sent letters to the investigative committee and the prosecutor's office with a request to check on the commissions of crimes during the preparation and the conduct of the special military operation by senior functionaries of the defence ministry. He said he won't publish those letters because of the investigations, but he's hoping they will deal with this. I don't think we should expect any such investigation, but it's a symbolic gesture designed to show that Wagner and Prigozhin are operating independently of the regime and to criticise how the state has conducted itself during the war. So that's where we are in the military space, David, though I know that Hamish and James will have further thoughts on some of these stories later on. Absolutely. Well, we'll come to James and Hamish uh, shortly, but Maiden Nanu, can I bring you in now? You've been looking at this meeting in Moldova. Uh, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is there. What stories have you been looking at today? Yes, so as Francis mentioned, Zelensky is at the meeting of the European political community in Moldova. And he's kind of repeated his statement that Ukraine is ready to be in the NATO military alliance. And he's also urged the West to provide security guarantees to both Ukraine and Moldova. As he says, this is going to add a new layer of protection against Moscow. These comments come after Macron said the West should offer Ukraine tangible and credible security guarantees. And he said that I think security guarantees are very important, not only for Ukraine, for our neighbours, for Moldova, because of Russia and their aggressions in Ukraine, and potentially aggression for some other parts of Europe. Lithuania's president said that Western allies should find something to compensate Ukraine for their inability to grant full NATO membership to the country. And he said, Ukraine needs to know what happens after the war is over. That's something which I guess he said in the past as well, but it's an ongoing debate. Thanks very much, Maidena. Uh, You've also been looking at issues with Sweden and NATO. Can you talk us through that? Yeah, so this is the news that Jens Stoltenberg, who is at a two-day meeting of NATO foreign ministers in Oslo. He said that he's going to soon travel to Turkey to discuss Sweden's NATO membership. And this is an attempt to really like bring to an end a process that's been delayed due to objections from Turkey and Hungary, who are two member countries. So he said that he'd spoken to the Turkish president earlier this week, and he's going to travel to Ankara to continue to address how Sweden can quickly become a member of NATO. The Swedish foreign minister said that, you know, Sweden has fulfilled all of its commitments and it's time for Turkey and Hungary to start the ratification of Swedish membership to NATO. And uh, quite a lot of the NATO foreign ministers said they think Sweden can become a member either before or at the NATO summit in Lithuania this July. 
I think it was the Norwegian foreign minister who said that this should happen at least before the summit in July. Thanks, Maiden. And just very quickly as well, we've talked about the um, the export restrictions on Ukrainian produce quite a few times uh, uh, on this podcast. There's been another update there. Can you talk us through it? OK, so Zelensky has called again for the unconditional removal of all of the export restrictions on Ukrainian agricultural products. And he said this uh, during talks with Ursula von der Leyen, who's the European Commission president. So these restrictions are set to end on June the 5th, I think. And Ukraine has previously warned that bans on its grain exports, which have been imposed by some EU countries, are actually helping Putin to divide Europe. And Poland, which is a staunch ally of Ukraine, imposed temporary restrictions on Kyiv's agricultural products last month. I think yesterday the Ukrainian Agricultural Ministry said that the continuation of these restrictions means putting weapons in Putin's hands against unity in Europe. So some quite strong language there. And they called for the restrictions to be cancelled. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Maidna. Thanks for joining us from the Foreign Desk. Um, for all of our listeners, I would say, of course, The Telegraph does run a daily live blog on the um, war in Ukraine. Uh, today, Maidna Nanu is obviously staffing it. So thank you so much for taking um, just 10 minutes out of your time to, to join us. Thank you very much, Maidna. Before we go back to Francis to talk about Emmanuel Macron, I just wanted to ask whether James or Hamish had anything to add on some of the military updates uh, we've been talking about today. Uh, James Kilner, why don't you start? Well, I've been focusing mainly on this uh, these, this border attack, which has apparently involved members of the Russian uh, Volunteer Corps and the uh, Russia Free Legion, which are two units, fairly murky units, which are linked to the Ukrainian military. The, the actual link is unclear. They claim that they get their commands directly. The Ukrainians have not sort of commented officially on it, but, but they, they've launched what appears to be the third attack into mainland Russia, well, since March. And uh, this seems a very sizable attack. There's plenty of videos on Telegram showing a major building in a border, Russian border town of um, Shebekino, which has about 40,000 people uh, on fire. And there's various other Telegram videos of residents of, of, the, t- of the town saying that they've fled, et cetera, et cetera. They're really scared. They're ringing the local hotlines and they can't get through, criticizing the, the local administration, et cetera, for not evacuating, this sort of thing. This comes after about a week of intensified shelling, according to the Belgorod regional governor. And I remember I was on the desk at the weekend and he said that the shelling around the town was so heavy that he couldn't even get into it. So uh, there's definitely something going on, something very serious going on. The Russian Ministry of Defense has claimed, and obviously with the Russian Ministry of Defense, you have to take it, uh, everything with a huge pinch of salt. They said that they um, killed 30 Ukrainian terrorists. That's their code for these uh, Ukrainian, pro-Ukraine Russian fighters. Killed 30 of them during this so-called skirmish or whatever battle. It's not really clear. And that they even attacked uh, Russia with some tanks. Now, that, that is definitely an escalation on previous reported attacks. Some, something is fairly serious going on there. Uh, just to finish off, it can be, you know, a bit bewildering why Russians are fighting for for Ukraine in, in, in this instance. And it's just uh, I do, it's a slight footnote needed. These, these units have a very strong connection with neo-Nazis. One of the founders is is a football hooligan, a avowed neo-Nazi, who owns a major neo-Nazi clothing label. And they don't like the Kremlin for various reasons, one of which is, is Russia's multi-ethnic population. They, they don't like that. And, and one of the things which came out of the 2014 initial attacks from Russia, by Russia on Ukraine, was this uh, Azov Battalion, which which comes with um, a very complicated background. Uh, when it was set up in 2014, it had a very strong uh, neo-Nazi brand, and that did attract uh, quite a lot of neo-Nazis into Ukraine, and hence we have these uh, pro-Ukraine Russian fighters who have been doing military stunts and, and attacking Russia allegedly on behalf of Ukraine in the last few months. Thanks very much, James. I'm sure we'll come back to that more in the future. As you said, as you said, it's a very complicated story. Uh, Hamish de Breton Gordon, um, I know you have some thoughts on this as well. Would you like to jump in? Yes. Uh, g- good afternoon, everybody. I I just want to talk a little bit about the drone attacks at the beginning of the week, and I won't cover any of the ground 
that I wrote about in the paper yesterday. But I've been uh, around the bazaars in the last 24 hours, hoovering up information and intelligence. And a few things have become much clearer to me. First of all, I'm pretty certain it wasn't a false flag operation. Whoever conducted it was in support of the Ukraine uh, operation here. Now, why? I think it sends a massive strategic uh, message across the world, actually, all about red lines, that Putin's red lines are vanishingly thin. And European leaders and perhaps some NATO leaders who might be getting a bit nervous should uh, steady themselves because the likelihood of any type of nuclear or or chemical, whatever attack that uh, Putin's been threatening from the get go have absolutely no substance. But also on the operational side, I think it has a huge impact. Uh, We were talking about these dreadful ballistic missile attacks. Perhaps come back, the fact the Russians are using ballistic missiles, multi-million dollar uh, bits of kit is is strange. But uh, the Ukrainians are knocking about 95% of them out of the sky. You know, the Russians are struggling to knock 50% out. And the drone strikes earlier this week were on what's called the, the Beverly Hills of Moscow, where all the elite and the oligarchs uh, work. We heard Medvedev, who is uh, Putin's attack dog, threatening to end James Cleverly, who is our foreign minister, uh, and that the Brits were now a viable target. Well, you know, the reason he's doing this is that uh, people in the Beverly Hills of Moscow are pretty upset now that they are targeted. They thought they were well out of it. It's not their children who are fighting in the Donbass and elsewhere and calling for better protection. Now, from a military operational perspective, we now see, and I get why Prigozhin is so hacked off, you know, the, the, the air defence that is probably protecting the Wagner Group and the others down there in the east are probably getting dragged back to Moscow to protect the oligarchs. Now, at this time of the fight, when we know that the Ukrainians are on the balls of their feet, to have vital military capability moved away to protect oligarchs is absolutely the last thing that one would do. But from a Ukrainian perspective, absolutely right. So I think just on the shaping operations that we're hearing about now, the drone strike earlier this week, I think is even more significant than perhaps um, uh, we wrote about and other commentators have suggested. Thank you very much, Hamish Breton-Gordon. Can I go back to Francis? Um, Emmanuel Macron has uh, said a lot of very interesting things um, in the the diplomatic sphere over the last day. Um, We wanted to treat this as a bit of a separate section because there's a lot going on. Could you talk us through what Macron said and what it might mean? Thanks. Yes, I spoke yesterday about what we expected the French president to say regarding Europe's shifting defence priorities. And he's actually gone much further in his remarks than many expected. He has admitted to Eastern European nations he should have heard their calls to take the threat from Russia on Ukraine more seriously, saying we lost an opportunity to listen to you. Some said you had missed an opportunity to shut up. I think we lost an opportunity to listen. This time, this will not happen. And there was great applause in the room. He was speaking at the Globesec security think tank in Bratislava. And when he says, we, you, some say you missed an opportunity to shut up, he was alluding to a remark in 2003, I think it was, by the then French president Jacques Chirac, who said East European nations who backed the United States and Britain's decision to invade Iraq, something that was opposed by France and Germany at the time, that they'd missed an opportunity to be quiet. And so Macron, I think, is trying to repair some of the damage which many Eastern European countries have not forgotten with regard to those remarks. He says, I don't think there is a Western and Eastern Europe, an old Europe and a new one. There is only one Europe with a will to build unity. He continued by insisting that Russia had lost all legitimacy and that Ukraine wouldn't be conquered. He said, we can all see what was supposed to happen in the special operation, but it's already a geopolitical failure. Ukraine is defending not only its own borders, but protecting Europe. And any ceasefire would play into Russia's hands. Time will not be on Russia's side. We must be clear a ceasefire is not enough. That will recreate a frozen conflict that will be another war for tomorrow. We need to help Ukraine lead an efficient 
counter-offensive. That, of course, tallies with a line that often Zelensky makes, that this is a war for Europe as opposed to just being a war over Ukraine. So I'm sure Kiev will be very cheered to hear these echoed by the French president. He went yet further, though. He said that the war and the West must mean that Ukraine gets tangible and credible security guarantees, stressing that it's in the West's interest that Kiev have assurances from NATO. That's why I'm in favour and will be the subject of collective talks in the following weeks to offer tangible and credible security guarantees to Ukraine. Uh, We have to build something between Israel-style security guarantees and fully-fledged membership of NATO. I had a harsh word for NATO in December 2019. Listeners will recall that we've talked about how he called the alliance brain dead at that time. But I can say that today Putin jolted it awake with the worst of electric shocks. So very punchy stuff. Those of a more hawkish persuasion in France and elsewhere seem to be collectively saying about time. However, there are those who are more sceptical as to how definitive Mr Macron's remarks are. They posit he might be playing to his audience as part of his initiative to build a new outer circle of the EU. And I think it is interesting to hear him reference not listening to countries' warnings about Russia when there are so many who are increasingly nervous about China, a country that he's actually been courting in recent months. And uh, no doubt some people feel that this is rather uh, a hypocrisy. Now, one more, more cautious French commentator I spoke to this morning also underlined that Macron is increasingly unpopular at home due to his pension reforms. So foreign policy offers him something of a salvation, as well as the possibility of lucrative defence contracts for France. I also wanted to draw attention to one other remark he made, that if Ukraine's coming a counteroffensive failed to meet its military objective and the war lasts, he says, I think at that time we will have to reassess the situation to see how to calibrate our support. It's hard to tell whether he means that Ukraine will have to expand its military support in that scenario or whether he means a reduction and calls for some kind of negotiations. But it's those kind of caveats that will no doubt cause concern in Kyiv, despite the fact that in many ways all of these lines that from President Macron will tally with the arguments made by President Zelensky, as I say, with regard to the significance of this war and the importance of the counteroffensive. If indeed we can call it a counteroffensive anymore, I mean, it would have been legitimate to call it that, I think, when the offensive was launched by the Russians around Bakhmut back in January, March time. But I think now, actually, it would just be an offensive um, because, of course, it's less of sort of responding to that as opposed to being something quite new. And that might explain a different way of conceiving it that Kiev has been trying to argue in in recent weeks. But anyway, I will I will stop there. An interesting and revealing speech, I think, from President Macron. But it'll be interesting to see how it's received. Thank you very much, Francis Dernley. James Kilner, can I come to you? Um, you're obviously a journalist who's reported from the Central Asian states for many, many years. And every time we get you on the pod, we'd always you know, hugely enjoy your, your downloads of the latest news from, um, from that area. What have you been looking at uh, over the past few weeks? So we've had some, um, the news never seems to stop at the moment regarding Russia's relations with with its former vassal states. Earlier this week, we had uh, the Georgian Prime Minister. Prime Minister in Georgia is the main sort of executive uh, position. Irakli Gadabishvili, um, he was at a security conference in Bratislava. And in in the security conference, he suggested that the reason for the war in, um, in Ukraine was Ukraine's drift towards joining NATO or sort of push towards joining NATO. This this went down extremely badly in Georgia, which is which is riven by huge debate and angst at the moment about the war in Ukraine. We have to, I, I'm sure our um, our listeners will remember that 20% of Ukraine of, of Georgia is actually occupied by Russia. This is uh, the breakaway regions of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. But since 2008, a war, Russia and Georgia fought a war for five days in August 2008. The Kremlin has recognized their independence, uh, backed by the military, etc., given very cheap electricity, all this sort of thing, to keep Georgia in this sort of semi-limbo state with its borders. The, the vast majority of the people in Georgia are pro-EU, pro-NATO. But the government, the Georgian dream government, which is funded by... Um, billionaire oligarch, really, who made his money in 1990s Russia, Bidzina Ivanishvili, 
is increasingly pro-Russia. Last week, the Kremlin restarted um, flights to Tbilisi from Moscow for the first time since 2019. This went down very badly, triggering protests, etc. Analysts said this was a Kremlin intent to destabilise the country, etc., etc. And now we have um, comments uh, like this from the Prime Minister. Moving further south, Armenia has had its own problems with the Kremlin, as we know. The Prime Minister there, Nikol Pashinyan, who's in Moldova today at the um, European Political Community Summit, he said that he has been increasingly irritated with uh, the Kremlin for failing to stop attacks by Azerbaijan along its border. Azerbaijan and Armenia have been rowing about uh, the status of a small enclave called Corno Karabakh since the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991. There was a, there was a war there, a very nasty war in 2020. Uh, which Azerbaijan effectively won and pushed uh, Armenia and forced out of it. But that has not stopped the fighting. There's been some big skirmishes um, ever since. Last summer, something like 300 soldiers were killed in, in one battle, which lasted a couple of days. And all the time, Russia has had so-called peacekeeping soldiers based on the border, and it's meant to be stopping this sort of thing from happening. It has failed to do that. Now, the Kremlin operates something called a uh, CSTO, which is a security organization that set up in the early 1990s after the collapse of the Soviet Union. It, it brings in a handful of these former Soviet countries. And Armenia is the first country, first member state of this of this unit, which has said that it's going to, it may drop out. The Xinjiang, the Prime Minister has been incredibly irritated that the Kremlin has not deployed the CSTO to impose peace. As we know, listeners to this podcast know that the only time the CSTO has ever deployed was in January last year to prop up uh, the Kazakh regime and to crush demonstrators on the street. So we now have Armenia, which historically has been uh, reliant on Moscow for its security, really grumbling, threatening to leave this for, for the Kremlin, very important security pact. That's something to watch. The, the the last thing I'd like to just bring up to listeners is a performance by Kasim Jomat Dokayev, the Kazakh president last week at a um, meeting of the Eurasian Economic Union in Moscow. Now, this was a sort of plenary session where the leaders of, of the Eurasian Economic Union, uh, Russia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Armenia, stood up and, and gave speeches uh, in front of the other, the other heads of states, etc., there's two, there's two two points to really highlight here. Lukashenko has just been given nuclear weapons by Putin, or rather Russia is stationing nuclear weapons for the first time since the early 90s inside Belarus on the borders of, of the European Union. And Lukashenko sort of half-jokingly said to Tokayev or to Kazakhstan, oh, you, can, you can also have nuclear weapons if you want, if you want to join political sort of super state, which Belarus and Russia are part of at the moment. So Kyiv sort of stood up and said, no, this is absolutely not happening. Um, uh, you know, this is a joke sort of thing. So that, you know, it's difficult to overemphasize how tough it is for a former Soviet leader to stand up in Moscow at a summit organized by the Kremlin for, for a Kremlin group and then criticize uh, the Kremlin and its main backer, Belarus, to the leader's face. And this is what Tokayev did. He said, no, this is a joke. Uh, we're not getting involved in any further political integration uh, within the Europe, Euro Eurasian Economic Union. And then he goes on to then say that the Eurasian Economic Union has an increasingly big problem because Belarus and Russia have created a super state within the group. And he goes on to say, and I quote, uh, there, is, you know, there are now active one military, one parliament, one leadership, one ambition, et cetera, et cetera. So he was leaving it in no doubt uh, that there was a distinction between Belarus Russia, and the rest of the members, which is an incredible thing to um, highlight live on TV in front of Lukashenko and Putin, who were listening to the side and, and by the way, sort of smirking their way through his speech. Putin actually looked really slumped down and bored and, and disinterested through the whole thing. And then at one point, Lukashenko and Putin shook hands. They were sitting next to each other, shook hands in a sign of uh, yeah, condensation and patronizing Tokayev, etc. One final thought on this. We've read and reported a lot about how the Kremlin is using, using the Eurasian Economic Union 
to skirt around Western sanctions. It has become the single most important tool that the Kremlin has for beating Western sanctions. Eurasian Economic Union effectively means there's no trade border between uh, member states and uh, paperweights, much reduced, that sort of thing. So what is happening is companies in Kazakhstan and Armenia and Kyrgyzstan are massively increasing their orders of cars, washing machines, iPhones, whatever it is, and then sending them on to Russia, where you know across these 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 paperless borders, etc. So the Kremlin is really reliant on the Eurasian Economic Union to get it through this this crisis, uh, this this war and this economic war with uh, with the West and, and Ukraine, and. It actually set up this Eurasian Economic Union group in May 2014, in a couple of weeks after it formally annexed Crimea and in the midst of organising uh, its initial invasion of the Donbass region. It was, and then the Eurasian Economic Union was formally set up on 1st of January 2015. It may just be a coincidence, but maybe, and I'm just putting it out there, the timing was too um, uh, perfect, and Putin may have been um, anticipating Western sanctions and have set up the Eurasian Economic Union to help him, Russia and the Kremlin, get through them. That's absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much, James Kilner. James, can I just stay with you with one question from me? Last time, um, I think we had you on the podcast, um, you spoke about the influence, the Chinese influence, and how it, it had started to look like maybe the, the vast sort of weight and power and uh, presence of Chinese sort of geopolitics and, and, and its wishes was swaying some of the Central Asian states um, aw- away from their earlier um, uh, sort of overtures to the West. Is that something, um, is that something you think we're still seeing? Um, is, is there an update, update there at all? We had a very large, a very important uh, Central Asia China summit in Xi'an, the former imperial capital, Chinese former imperial capital, uh, about a fortnight ago, in which uh, President Xi, Chinese President Xi, sort of summoned the five Central Asian leaders, very much like vassals, to come to his court. And at his court, he bestowed on them these major economic deals. And at the same time, the Central Asian leaders sort of gave out very politically, very useful uh, statements like Tokayev, Kazakh president, saying that Taiwan should only be China and it doesn't have an independent future. There were no statements after that summit, which lasts about two days, on Ukraine or on Russia. But my feeling is that Behind closed doors, China has already nailed its mask to Russia over the war in Ukraine. Maybe not in a in an overtly hardcore manner, but I think behind the scenes they will be doing things to help Putin, who's become an increasingly weakened ally of China and important for its gas, etc. They'll be helping to prop Putin up. And I would be very, very surprised if during these conversations in Xi'an, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Xi missed the opportunity to pressure Central Asian states into softening their less than enthusiastic stance towards Russia's policies and, 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 and invasion in Ukraine. But beyond that, we don't have anything more public to go on. But that, that I think, is sort of probably what, what was happening behind closed doors. Thank you very much, James Kilner. Hamish de Breton Gordon, can I come to you? You're actually in the Daily Telegraph offices, so it's very nice to see you again. What other um, analysis and updates do you have for us? Well, it's great to be in Telegraph Tower. So just just a couple of things I'd like to to cover. Um, But before I do, I I don't know if people have been uh, looking deeply into social media today, but there's some very interesting pictures of the Cursed Bridge with the, the sort of main stanchions and massive great cracks in them. Is this part of the shaping operation? Who knows? But lots of talk about Storm Shadow, the cruise missile that, uh, that the Ukrainians now have taken Kirsch Bridge out. It might not be needed. Uh, so I think we'll keep looking at that closely. But the two issues that I think are, are quite significant, uh, and we, we've, we've talked about the ballistic missiles, 10 of them raining down on Kiev today, all taken out. Now, some people might remember that probably two or three months ago, the British MOD intelligence update, which 
comes out every morning, described that the Russians were taking uh, their nuclear warheads off these ballistic missiles because they were getting so short of cruise missiles and others and putting conventional warheads on them. I found it very, rather interesting that earlier this week, Lukashenko was offering nuclear weapons to anybody who joined the Anglo-Russian coalition. So unless they're going to throw these warheads at people, it just reiterates yet again how hollow the nuclear uh, threats are. I th- think the, the, the other issue that is on everybody's lips, the, the spring, the summer, whatever offensive we want to call it, w- with my commanding officer, first Royal tank regiment hat on, uh, I'm now thinking that the Ukraine military have had the modern Western tanks, Challenger 2s, Leopard 2s, the, the armoured fighting vehicles, the Bradleys, etc., the uh, Western artillery for about two and a half months now. Uh, and when I trained my regiment in combined arms warfare and what we call collective training when you put it all together, yeah, about uh, six weeks to two months w- was about the prime period. So I would gauge that, that they're pretty ready by now. I'm always impressed how can I and how effective the Ukrainian military are. The fact that we know virtually nothing about what is happening, um, I think it's really, really interesting. We talked about shaping ops. Putin's now concerned about Moscow. He's concerned about the border incursions. Yeah, is the cursed bridge about to fall down? We haven't even talked about Zaporizhia nuclear power station, which actually the Sky, Sky News did a really good piece on yesterday, um, which I'm sure is still on, uh, on social media. I think things are pre- pretty set when it's going to happen, where it's going to happen and how it's going to happen. Yeah, you know, we haven't a clue. And if we haven't a clue, I don't think the Russians do. And I think they're so... Um, we talk about balance uh, and we talk about getting behind the enemy and uh, turning them. I think the Russians, I think Putin is is spinning on his heels at the moment uh, and, and getting dizzy. And, you know, if I was a Ukraine commander, I'd be pretty happy uh, and things are, are ready to strike. So um, let, let's hope we get a resolution relatively quickly. But uh, uh, I'm sure it will be a surprise to all of us when, when it actually starts moving. Thanks very much, Hamish de Breton, Gordon. Uh, Francis Sternley, it's all yours. Right, well, I made reference last week to the comparisons made between the Battle of Bakhmut and the Battle of Stalingrad in World War II and how I was asked by the Foreign Desk to write a piece exploring how the two battles are alike and unalike. Now, I should say off the bat, in doing so, I've forced to look at them analytically and I know that this battle has enormous emotional resonance for Ukrainians and I'm not trying to diminish that nor am I trying to diminish the suffering experienced by those who have served there. I'm merely looking at them as a sort of historian and and as I say looking at it from a military strategic perspective. The piece I wrote is now published. It's called Bakhmut and the Echoes of Stalingrad and you'll find it in the description for this episode. The visual team did a great job pulling together comparative photos of the two battles and I'm grateful to listeners who've written to me on Twitter offering their reflections. Regular listeners will know that I think the comparisons are in many ways absurd, not least relating to the scale of the battles relative to each other and the nature of the war that Russia is now fighting. But that's not to say there aren't resonances, not least in their horrors, as I say, and in their strategic role as a vital battle in their respective wars. And indeed, in the piece, I argue that like Stalingrad, Bakhmut may come to be seen as a turning point, but not for the reasons traditionally associated with that great battle from World War II. So for those who aren't familiar, the conventional view of Stalingrad is that it was psychologically decisive, that the German surrender came as a hammer blow to the Axis from which it never recovered. And certainly it was terrible for morale. Wehrmacht generals and soldiers relay as much in their diaries and memoirs, which I've read extensively. Can can we say that Bakhmut has the same resonance? Certainly it has symbolic importance with Zelensky visiting the city more than once. But to say it's decisively so, I think is a real stretch. It's not a great city like Kiev, the capture of which could have proven fatal for Zelensky in all senses. Neither it does it have this immense innate value as a city, as Stalingrad is often argued to have been, it's, uh, which was of a core industrial and armament centre, nor does it as a strategic target, granting access, which Stalingrad did to the oil fields of the Caucasus, something that Hitler believed would be fatal for the Soviet Union if they were captured. Bakhmut's strategic significance 
was different. And uh, when Russia fought to seize to, to seize it back in August, it was not as an industrial prize, but as an important gateway uh, or sort of wagon wheel of logistical inflow and outflow to four cities in Donetsk. Whomever controlled it would have had an important staging post for an advancing army as Russia's was at that stage. That is no longer the case. Nine months on, it's a ruin, a hazard. Its utility has vanished. Yet revisionists hold that view of Stalingrad too. For some, the city's real importance morphed from its geographic location and its innate urban characteristics to its attritional value for the Soviet army. It bled the Wehrmacht and it fixed it in position as the Soviets prepared counteroffensive, most notably Operation Uranus, which led to the encirclement of tens of thousands of Germans still in the city. One day, historians may say Bakhmut did the same for Ukraine. Indeed, there is, of course, speculation, as we've talked about on the podcast many times, that the Ukrainian army may try and conduct a similar pincer movement around Russian troops in the coming weeks or months. Of course, such a shift in urban utility is not unusual in the annals of war. Moscow in 1812 was an important prize for Napoleon, albeit not as big as it would have been for the Germans in 1941-42, yet ceased to be so after it was burned down by the Russians. Battlefields evolve. And only fools fight the battles of yesterday, as many claims the Russians have done in Bakhmut. So whilst I think the comparison is overdone, and as I say, I have huge question marks about those who say that Bakhmut is explicitly a a Stalingrad type situation. I do think this serves as an interesting exercise in reflection. And I look forward to hearing listeners thoughts on this because I know they have many. Thank you very much, Francis uh, Durnley, for that. And yes, and listeners, we will put Francis's piece in the show notes. So if you do want to read it later on the podcast, um, after the podcast, um, do go there to find it. Hamish de Breton Gordon, can I come to you next? Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks for that. I, if I may just indulge myself a tiny little bit, um, I, I saw the Russians at very close hand in Syria for a number of years. And uh, when I was helping people like James LeMessure and others protect civilians, but but also collect evidence of atrocities. And um, when when I got comments from the Kremlin, you, you really knew that you were being uh, effective. Uh, and when I see Medvedev uh, this week threatening Cleverly and James Cleverly, right honourable James Cleverly, of course, our foreign minister, and outbursts from Prigozhin, yeah, it makes me think the Russians are off balance. Um, I... I've only boxed a few times at school and in the army. Uh, but when your opponent is off balance, that is when you strike. So expect a strike fairly soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francis and Hamish. Uh, James Kilner, would you like the very final words? Well, I'm not sure I can follow up with, with anything after that from Hamish. That was, uh, that was great. All I can say is I'll, I'll be jumping back onto the desk and watching uh, what these um, pro-Ukraine, Russian, ne- neo-Nazi-linked fighters are, are up to in southern Russia and, and how serious this uh, so-called incursion is and then this attack on this uh, Russian border town. It's probably important at this point to add a, a bit of a footnote about the neo-Nazi uh, link US Western analysts who, who know far more than I do about this, although they have said that the Azov Battalion brand became became a very important in, in the not, global Nazi scene in 2014, 2015. It's been cleaned up a bit now and, and they've diminished the links, etc. And the, the battalion has been taken under command of the Ukrainian, official Ukrainian military. So it's a totally different thing than it was in 2014, 2015 when it's attracting all these Russian, Russian linked Nazi, Nazi guys. Nevertheless, uh, it's going to be interesting to see what they've been up to in southern Russia on the Lake of Uh Another thought is about uh, Prigrozhin and his Wagner group. There's been a lot of chats uh, on the podcast and in, in the newspaper and in, on various blogs and Twitter stuff that I read on, on, on uh, Russia about what he's going to do after his his soldiers have left the back area which is officially going to happen on Monday, I think. Um, and he's currently, I've been reading about it this morning on the Telegram Russian uh, social media system, he's currently on, a, on a, something of a tour of Russia, trying to whip up support for whatever he's up to. People can sometimes consider this some sort of 
challenge to the Kremlin uh, and the way he he criticizes very senior officials like the Minister of Defense Shoigu or, or the Chief of the General Staff uh, Gerasimov. But in 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 actual fact, it's more he he's playing his role in the system that he's been given. He's playing it very diligently, very carefully. He's allowed to, and this has been the system the Russians have run for cent for for generations and centuries. That he, these these high profile courtiers, they're allowed to criticize each other. They're allowed to criticize other other ministers, senior officials, etc. What they're not allowed to do is criticize the czar and challenge the czar uh, directly. And, and in this case, that that's Putin. He's playing the role of this right wing hardcore Russian warrior political guy. And there's a gap in on this spectrum of the Russian uh, political system left by Vladimir Zirinovsky, who, who died uh, more or less on the eve of, of the Russia's invasion of Ukraine or just after. He occupied the space on the right-hand side of Russian politics for about two decades. And he was this crazy ultra-nationalist who's floating these crazy ideas Sort of like as a balloon ideas, which which the Kremlin could ask him to do to test out how they went down with the Russian public, the Russian population, etc. And they more or less get shot down, and he'd been put in his place, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But he he was accepted, and he was allowed to criticize officials. And I think we'll we may see Prigozhin emerge into this role. So if he does become some sort of political player. It'll be with the direct blessing of his master, which is Putin. He's only doing as, as Putin uh, asked him to, and he'll he'll be able to set up a party on the hard right to attract people who need that political outlet, and it'll all be controlled by the Kremlin and by Putin. One example of this uh, was at the weekend. Uh, it was another busy weekend, of course. There was a major car rally in. Um, in the Urals, I think it was near Katrinburg, but I am not I can't hundred percent remember, uh, on Sunday. And and this was done by pro Wagner, pro Prigrosian supporters. Very rare actually to see a demonstration or protest in Russia, primarily in favor of Prigrosian and, and uh Wagner. So we have all these little things going on, which I think are shifting things uh Prigrosian's stance. But he's only doing them because he's allowed to do them. And in, in my mind, he is operating directly within the Russian system. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine The Latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website, where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to podcast apps. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Giles Gear, and the executive producers are Louisa Wells and David Knowles.